What could you learn from a guy who has 1.7 million subscribers to his YouTube music channel? He's got 275 million channel views across all of his videos. I'm talking about my long-awaited interview with Peter Hollins, a guy who has just been crushing it on YouTube with his music for years. I know you're going to like this one, so stay tuned. I'm Bob Baker, and this is the Music Marketing Podcast, episode 112. Welcome to the Music Marketing Podcast, where I share marketing and career advice for musicians, singers, songwriters, and music business pros just like you. If you don't already, please subscribe to the audio podcast in iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, or wherever you consume such products. And if you're catching the YouTube version, please, by all means, subscribe to the channel there. So a few months ago, I interviewed Peter Hollins, who's an artist who specializes in a cappella uh, music videos. Either he sings all the parts himself or he collaborates with other people, other YouTubers, and a number of well-known people, too. And I did release a small section of that interview where Peter talks about how to legally post cover songs. That's one of his specialties, too. He mostly does cover songs. And in that one, he talked about the current state of YouTube and cover songs and how artists can legally get their versions of other people's songs on YouTube. But I got a little sidetracked and didn't get out the rest of the interview until now. So in this, we learn about Peter's story, what led to him starting his YouTube channel. He dissects exactly what he did in the early years that eventually led to his success. He talks about collaboration, how he relates to his fans, and much, much more. So grab a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a beer or whatever the heck you want to drink while you listen to podcasts and check this one out. I'll have a few thoughts on the other side. Well, on Skype with me right now is a singer and musician extraordinaire, Peter Hollins from Eugene, Oregon. Hi, Peter. How are you? I'm doing good, Bob. Honored to be here with you. Yeah, this I'm really excited to uh, to speak with you today for so many reasons. We have a lot of ground to cover because I want to find out about your personal story. We're going to squeeze as much in as we as we can here. So, are you uh, like born and raised in the in the Oregon area? Yeah, I'm a I'm a born raised Oregonian. I grew up in a town of uh, twelve thousand. Ended up uh, staying close to home to uh, keep close to a, a love, and so I went to University of Oregon and. I actually, I went there to become a choral director, and a, and then I ended up just getting my opera degree because it was the easiest way out. I just, I was, my mom promised she, I promised her I would get a degree, so I ended up just getting an opera degree to get out of there. Oh wow, cool! Now on your, yeah, we're gonna talk about YouTube and all this stuff, and so you, you, you make references to the uh, Holland's family, and so did you grow mm -hmm. up like in a musical family, and you incorporate other members, or what's the, what's the no, reference yeah, to the family? No, yeah, so that is something that organically was created by the fact that I never wanted to call the people who liked my music fans. I always felt that fan had such a negative connotation. And so kind of together with, um, you know, I kind of crowdsourced what they felt they were. And we, we started calling ourselves uh, the Hollins family, which in the end was great because at the time when I started, you know, I was just a musician and then I had a wife and now I have a kid. And now it's like, it, it just makes a lot of sense that, my fan base uh, is the Hollins family. Oh, cool, cool. See, I didn't even realize that. So, I, yeah, I, I did my research on you, and I have facts and figures about your, you know, some of the awesome accomplishments that you've had. But I, at first glance, yeah, when, usually when you see the word someone's last name and family, it, it's it's a reference to a family unit, you know, or a band or an yeah. ensemble. But no, I think that's really cool that you you're referring to your your tribe as the Hollins family. That's the best way to describe them, you know. So again, I don't know the full story here, but as I was looking through your, you know, your like mini bio, I think maybe just even your about page on YouTube, you were on a, in like in 2010, you were like NBC had a show it was called Sing Off that you were on. Yeah. Yeah, so the Sing Off the Sing Off was the same show that Pentatonix came from. They've been destroying the Christmas uh, holiday season the last 3 or 4 years with number one hits. Um, yeah, they've done really I, well. Yeah. yeah. And so the acapella group in college that I had founded uh, ended up getting on that show and they asked me to to come along and I ended up doing most of the solos. 
and, and before that, I had no no desire of like a an artist career, um, and that kind of gave me the impetus to begin turning the mic on myself because I was a recording engineer in my tiny little genre of acapella at the time, and so, instead of recording collegiate acapella groups that don't always have the most hardworking or talented people always. Uh, it, it was kind of cool at like a late twenties age to be like, Oh, I can return the mic on myself and start trying to do it myself. And that was, that was a lot of fun. Cool. So I noticed that it looks like you've started, or at least based on your current, your main YouTube channel that was started in 2011. Your experience with the TV show maybe inspired you and gave you a little bit of a leg up because you had a little bit of exposure when you started the YouTube channel. Was that a natural natural extension of that experience? Yeah, I mean, I think that's very easy to think that that would be the case. Um, unfortunately, you know, at the end of 2010, because the show literally was during the Christmas season of 2010, I hadn't even understood and really grasped the entire nature of quote unquote social media at the time. So like, during the show, I, like there was like six or seven episodes, I finally started a, a Twitter account, you know, and I had a, I had a, a personal Facebook account. But literally, the only thing that actually happened for me in that regard was maybe two or three hundred extra Facebook friends that I eventually actually started accepting, uh, with the notion of maybe making music for them down the road. Uh, but I, because I was singing on behalf of this group that wasn't my name, it didn't really turn into anything uh, from a brand perspective for Peter Hollins instead of like my group on the rocks. Uh, it, it, what it did do is it surrounded me by a bunch of like-minded, very talented people. And, you know, I, I started really quickly saying, hey, I have a few hundred people asking me to do music. My, my father at the time who was um, on his deathbed had always been asking me to record music. And so uh, between the two, it finally dawned on me. I'm like, these people on YouTube are making what I believe is a living. And I started, re just, I started just reverse engineering it. Uh, so it gave me the impetus to, to turn on the mic on myself. I started seeing that the, the best place to release music at the beginning of 2011 uh, was YouTube. And so I started part-time creating these music videos. And just like I taught myself recording engineering from scratch by myself, I started teaching myself cinematography, video editing, and I just started deep diving into it and seeing what others were doing that I looked up to in the space and just saying, how did they get there? And I started basically mimicking and copying uh, their workflow. And I think that's a great point because I even – there's a section in one of my books where I said before you can uh, embrace a particular format or platform or whatever, like YouTube or whatever it is, you have to first become a consumer of that before you can, can really be an effective producer <laughs> within it. Like a lot of times people go, I hear I should be blogging, Bob. Should I, should I blog? And I go, well, do you read other blogs? And if, if they go, no, not really, then I'm going like, well, why would you <laughs> – you know, if you're going to be a podcaster, listen to podcasts. Yeah. And, and – see what works and what doesn't, what resonates with you and what Right, what that's, our, that's your research. I mean, just as if you're running a business of any kind, you have to do your research. And so you need to consume what you want to create. Yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome. And so, again, I guess I'm going to jump, I'm jumping around the chronology here, but leading up to this, you being in the, the NBC show and starting YouTube, you've always been a fan of acapella music, or, yeah. right? And so you, yeah. you had an experience of that performing with groups, I guess, and these groups prior to the show, you didn't lead them, you were, you were a member of different groups? or Yeah, so really quickly, uh, my first actual like spark of life in my, in my body was, was the first time I listened to a cassette tape in middle school of an acapella group from actually uh, Brigham Young University. And in my head, I was like, oh, that would be so great to do that. I had never been in choir before. And, uh, you know, the family I was with at the time was like, well, they, they, you know, this is this is what happens in choir. They have these acapella groups. And then I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And then my mom forced me into choir in high school. Uh, and and by the time I got to college, I just assumed there'd be an acapella group there. Uh, and there wasn't. So I founded one and I found singers and I, I created one. And that was a really good experience. I just fell in love with the sound. And, and eventually, you know, we wanted to record CDs and we had a short little experience at a recording studio nearby and it like killed me because the guy was so slow and he was charging so much. So I put my my money where my mouth was and I took all my money I had saved for my master's degree and I purchased basically, a, you know, a home studio recording and I started recording our CDs and I started recording the sister groups uh, at the university CDs and I started recording people CDs all across the nation, whether it was at Yale or Harvard or Florida or Georgia. And, and then basically 
between doing that and then doing Royal Caribbean, <laughs> singing on cruise ships got a really bad name because of Simon Cowell on American Idol. But it was actually a really great experience. I got to do that with my wife, who's also a professional singer. So between recording acapella groups, doing the Royal Caribbean gig, that was my entire like 2004 to 2010. Yeah, I just promised myself that every penny I'd made the rest of my life would be uh, out of music somehow. And I, I made that promise to myself my last real non-music job as a caterer and cool so yeah when was the last time you you worked for someone else we're not 2000 so- 2004 i had a full-time job uh that i was doing as a as a pasta maker uh while i was attending the university of oregon for my my music degree yeah even before you got on youtube you were you've been full-time even prior to that in the nbc show and all yeah that, performing right? and engineering yes mm-hmm so this is another like great example of, uh, you know, when you hear about people having this huge success, you often don't hear the story about the years of preparation that went into it. So you obviously were, were you know, sowing seeds in not only vocally, uh, uh, you know, technically learning skills that helped you a great deal when you, when you finally did get on YouTube in 2011. Right, yeah, the stereotypical 10,000 hours were definitely put in through taking voice lessons for almost... 10 or 12 years and you know the uh, the actual performing on cruise ships all the time and and then the recording engineer i think they were all prerequisites for the infrastructure that i kind of needed to just immediately start on the ground running so you got on youtube in in 2011 again yeah you didn't i guess i'm glad you clarified you really didn't have this big fan base because no i had literally started from from like almost almost zero i mean I, i definitely had like a few hundred people so when i initially made my first video I am a shameless self promoter as as most of the people who who started from nothing were, right? We have to start from 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 nowhere and just be like, I love this. I put this out there. I'm so happy about it. Digest it, share it, you know, I mean, you just have to be confident in that. I started from zero and it was fun to see see it grow. What was your initial uh yeah, the, the initial response and when did you know, uh-oh, I could be onto something here? I mean, was it, was it right away? Did it take a year or two? No. Or? Well, <laughs> I've always just absolutely adored uh, gamification, and I've really kind of almost saw initially, you know, the numbers and rankings uh, of, of just like just being like one big video game. And how can I, how can I set myself up for success more the next time and the next time? And I'd always look at my analytics and the marketing I was doing. How well was it working? And I got really excited about about the just the next video being bigger and and how do I make it successful and I think for probably about 16 months, it was definitely part time. I was definitely not, you know, I was definitely in the red, just like any business. Like you have to just assume you're not going to make money for two or three years um, and you have to put a, a bunch of hard work into it. I luckily came across a young lady by the name of Lindsay Sterling. Um, and in April of 2012, we did our first collaboration together. And I think that video, not only from what came from it from a gross revenue standpoint of just like that one single basically giving me a grand every every month uh, thereafter it was like all of a sudden I was like oh I can pay my rent and it was kind of a light bulb switch of like I'm gonna stop recording other people uh, totally and then I'm gonna start doing this full time but it wasn't just the onslaught of the fan acquisition that that occurred because of the collaboration and the money but the most important thing was that working with with Lindsay Sterling and actually, our cinematographer at the time, uh, Devin Supertramp, who both of them have millions and millions of followers by now, it, it was just the understanding of looking at my fellow peers as that, as peers and not competitors, and and kind of shifting what we're really taught early on uh, that that all these other artists are kind of our competitors, right? We're we're all trying to get the same awards, and like we all want to have all their fans, and I almost had this like subconscious idea that was in my brain that like on somebody's iPhone was just one artist and it was, and, and I wanted that person to be me. Right. And now I'm like, that makes no sense. We all have multiple artists that we love and it's not just one person. And so collaboration really brought just such an inspiration. It, it was a lot more than just like acquiring fans and, and making money. It was just really understanding that the rising tide lifts all boats and to start looking at my peers as thus, and helping them and educating them and 
yeah, that was the kind of just like the start for me. That's that's awesome. Yeah, and, and that yeah, you're you're right. It's contrary to a lot of the ways that people uh, normally think of those things. And you have done a lot of collaborations since then. And if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I know it's a it's a well somewhat common thing for like serious YouTubers to collaborate with other people that are well known on YouTube. And I it's not, it looks like you've done that, but you've also collaborated with some. Well-known people like did, did I see Jason Mraz listed there and some other yeah. high-profile high people? Gosh. Jason's such a, a terrific human being. Um, yeah, um, who are some of know, the folks got, that I, you have collaborated with that we you know recognizable names and other popular YouTubers would be? What, yeah, yeah, I, I've been lucky enough to work with uh, Jason Mraz and Hunter Hayes, and I got to work on writing a song with Brian Wilson, who's literally like the godfather of harmony in my mind. I just did a show with Gladys Knight. I mean, the, all that stuff is like, oh, it's such an honor and privilege to work with them because you, you know, you look up to these people all the time. I see the future of the music industry moving forward as being one that is truly based on collaboration for so many reasons. One of the best things about the ethos of of what YouTube has been since its incarnation is that it's it's been truly about helping one another. So great, Peters. There's just so many things about YouTube that I want to ask. One thing that you've used very effectively that a lot of other bands, like our friend Jack Conti in the in Pomplamoose, and I've uh, interviewed also Carmen. You know, a lot, but a lot of people mm-hmm. have done really well with cover songs, and that's kind of been the staple of your popularity. Is you primarily focused on your unique acapella versions of cover songs? Is that fair to say? Yeah, I would say when I'm when I'm kind of going for fan acquisition and, and marketing uh, and acquiring new fans, I definitely concentrate on doing songs that are being searched, that are being suggested within the platform for sure. Absolutely. What's the ratio of uh, of uh, cover songs versus original songs or co-writes that, yeah. you've, that you've done over the years? I would say it's about 90-10. You know, I've been working really, really hard on a staple of original material that I want to release all at once. Um, and I've been dripping out a few things here and there. But I do truly believe that my public domain songs are, are original. So I, I consider those part of my staple of original material i I love basically creating that you know that really big fan base and then kind of like forcing them to listen to something that they haven't really ever done before whether we're talking about danny boy or poor way frank stranger or parting glass um being that uh, classically trained singer i really like kind of doing that uh pop classical josh grobany type middle ground and so i love i love those beautiful folk songs and so the cool thing about that is that you can you know you can monetize those as though they are original material but yeah the uh, the cover the cover song is kind of part of the game right i hope you enjoyed listening to that as much as i enjoyed interviewing peter just what a wealth of knowledge and information there And while this is the bulk of the interview that I did with him, there's actually another segment that I'm going to release soon where he really goes into detail about his best practices and his advice for new artists on how to use YouTube in particular to dominate your genre. So stay tuned for that. But let's first go over what he discussed in this part of the interview. As we pointed out, he had a lot of experiences leading up to him even starting his YouTube channel. He formed his own acapella group. He learned skills in the studio and how to record and engineer. He had taken vocal lessons for more than a decade. All of these things culminated in a set of skills that served him well when he started his YouTube channel. So the lesson for you is nothing that you do is wasted. Your life is full of experiences. So how can you leverage and utilize the things you've already done in your life to help serve you in whatever project you're working on now? When he got on YouTube and decided to get serious about it, he researched it. He used the term reverse engineered. He deconstructed, examined what the other popular YouTubers were doing at the time. He noted what seemed to be working for them, and he implemented those things into his own efforts. Are you doing that with your creativity, with your music? A lot of people say, I don't know what to do. This marketing promotion thing confuses me. Well, the clues are out there if you just look for them. Go to your favorite artist websites or their YouTube channels or their social media platforms and see what they're doing. What seems to be working for them? What's getting the most engagement? What resonates with your own style and personality? And then do your own version of those things. Don't plagiarize or just copy someone blatantly, but you can borrow those concepts and apply them to your unique situation. 
But yes, it takes time to research and observe and take notes and do this repeatedly over time. And if you think that type of research is work and drudgery, notice what Peter said about it. He mentioned gamification. For him, it was a game to figure out how he could make his next video bigger, more popular, more views than the previous one. He made a game out of it, something he actually enjoyed and was challenged to do. So how could you make a game out of this? How could you make it fun and maybe tap into your own competitive spirit to keep bettering yourself on YouTube or in live gigs or whatever venue is important to you? So there's a lot of great lessons there. I hope you enjoyed listening to that. So leave a comment if there's a way to do that wherever you are consuming this, or shoot me an email even. Send your thoughts to bob at bob-baker.com. Just don't forget the hyphen or the dash between my first and last name, bob at bob-baker.com. And in addition to that, I want to encourage you to get on the music marketing VIP list. Speaking of email, I'll even give you a collection of music promotion ebooks and tip sheets when you do. Just go to thebuzzfactor.com, click the Music Marketing Secrets image on the right, then enter your name and email, and boom, you're on the list. Again, that's at thebuzzfactor.com. And if you'd like to support my ongoing efforts to educate, inspire, and empower creative people around the world, please consider becoming a patron. Just go to patreon.com slash bobbaker, without the hyphen there, All these links and the stuff I talked about will be in the show notes of the podcast or in the video description on YouTube. Thanks again for listening. Please share this podcast or this video with your friends who could really use a boost of inspiration. Thanks for all you do to create great music and share it with the world. I'm Bob Baker saying so long for now.